Hello, I'm, I'm Bu Hussein Hay. I'm the Clinical Director for Gastroenterology and Endoscopy at King's. Uh, I'm really pleased to uh, talk to you today about uh, the technique of throat spray for upper GI endoscopy. So we chose this topic as it's probably something that's not taught very well, probably not done very well much of the time, um, but can have a really significant or sizable impact on your patient comfort and anxiety, and ultimately, therefore, your ability to perform a really high quality diagnostic test. And if we've got time, I'll also touch on how and when to give sedation and when to place the mouth guard. But ultimately, the point of throat spray is to minimize the gag reflex by diminishing sensation. But this in itself can be an extremely disconcerting experience for many people. Um, and so it helps to let people know what's coming. And I have a script that I follow once I've given the first set of sprays and more of that as we go on. Um, before we start, I think it's helpful to understand the gag reflex, the neuroanatomy of the gag reflex and what it is we're trying to achieve, then hopefully the technique will make more sense. This diagram shows the glossopharyngeal nerve, the ninth cranial nerve and the seat of the gag reflex. I think it often surprises people that the main focus of the reflex is actually here at the base of the tongue with the lingual branch of the nerve. And yes, of course, there is innovation of the pharynx, but the gag reflex is mostly triggered at the base of the tongue. So once you understand this, the target of throat spray becomes really clear. Um, so if we just use this bendy nozzle and stick it right to the back of someone's throat and start merrily spraying it around, not only will it not work, it will trigger a recoil, which will then probably trigger a gag reflex more in surprise than anything else. Your patient's anxiety level will ramp up and it will be that much harder to proceed. So I ask the patients to tilt their head back and instead of placing the nozzle right back here, the first step should be to place the tip of the nozzle just here at the anterior part of the tongue, but not touching it. Um, so that when you spray, um, the liquid will trickle backwards down the base of the tongue and form a pool at the back of the throat. And I ask, obviously, as shown here, I ask the patients to tilt their head back, take a deep breath and hold their breath when they're ready, then open wide. And I'll then spray eight sprays onto the front of the trunk so it li the liquid will then trickle back into the pharynx. And then I ask the patient to swallow and then you can apologize for the taste. So then uh, I'll explain in a few seconds, you'll feel your mouth and your tongue go numb. It might even feel like a burning for a few seconds, but don't worry, that's normal. You might feel like you can't swallow or there's a blockage at the back of the throat. Don't worry, that's not real. It's just the effect of the spray. Just focus on slow, deep breaths through your nose. That will really help. If you want to take a swallow, you can still do that. There's no paralysis. You're completely safe and your oxygen levels are 100% or whatever they are. I'll then ask them to tilt their head back for a second time take a deep breath and hold, and then spray another eight sprays to the back of the throat so that it creates a pool of liquid. I then ask the patient to gargle for a few seconds and imitate it for them so that they can understand what's required. And after a few seconds, ask them to swallow down again. With the first spray, you've effectively taken out the lingual branch receptors by trickling the liquid over the back of the tongue. And with the second spray, you cover them again, but also take out the pharyngeal branch receptors with the gargle. By the way, the throat spray itself is 10 milligrams per spray, the maximum dose is 200 milligrams, so 16 sprays is well within the recommended dose and achieves a better result. Please do try this, I think you really will find it helpful. So combining this uh, with midazolam and, and possibly fentanyl produces good results. Just one quick slide on midazolam, we all know this, every registrar and every trainee I've asked knows that the onset of action on midazolam is just under three minutes. The half-life is around 20 minutes with in the, an elimination half-life is about one and a half hours. Yet we most often put the mouth guard in first, ramp up the patient's anxiety, then inject midazolam, wait 20 or 30 seconds as everyone's getting impatient, and then start. Of course, the sedation hasn't had time to work. You struggle, patient is anxious, you often fail to intubate, or if you do, it's not very pleasant, and you give more sedation, and then the patient's asleep by the time you pull the scope out while the, when the procedure's finished. So the message is give the sedation time to work. Give it at least two minutes and 30 seconds. And you can actually watch it working by watching the blink rate of your patient, which will increase uh, around the two minute 30 mark. I usually give two milligrams, uh, but one milligram is actually fine if you give it enough time to work. And remember, this is conscious sedation. Your patient will still be able to respond to commands with one or two milligrams of midazolam. So you can leave the mouth guard out until the two minute 30 mark or beyond, then ask the patient to open their mouth and put it in and then you can proceed comfortably. And the combination of using the effective throat spray and, and giving midazolam enough time to work will make you successful. So it will take some of, the, some of the courage of your convictions, I think, to persuade your team to do this with you. But if you explain the rationale, I, I'm sure they'll be willing to help. Your patients will thank you for it. And ultimately, 
we think you'll have a better outcome and, and a more effective procedure and detect more abnormalities. Thanks very much for your time.